Hello, and welcome to Mapping the College Edition, a podcast where we explore the landscape of the college theater world and try to demystify this daunting audition process. I'm your host, Charlie Murphy, director of MTCA, that's Musical Theater College Auditions, and today we've got a 21 stands for 21st century kind of show lined up for you. Rebecca Kupka Overton from Malloy Cap 21 is on the show today, uh, and Rebecca has been a kind friend and supporter of MTCA for many years now. Uh, she's done private walk-ins for us for the past few years, and even while we were on a break today during the show, uh, she started giving us a full commercial for MTCA, so much so that Megan had to throw some music over it, and BPN is going to start charging us as an advertisement. Um, but I do think she has a really great perspective on this process as someone who is the head of recruitment, but not the head of the program. It's a very interesting thing that Malloy does in having her do the audition tour while not in the middle of directing multiple shows and dealing with the same level of student drama that a lot of program heads have to deal with. Today on the show with Rebecca, we got into the history of CAP 21 from NYU to an independent school and then joining Malloy College, soon to be, or maybe now is, Malloy University. We recorded this a few months ago. It could be. Uh, we talked about the nature of degree semantics, whether it says theater arts or music theater, etc. And we get a little bit into the granularity of how the accreditations work. Now, we talk about the commuter life of Malloy versus the NYC campus. We talk about tapping by yourself in front of Randy Skinner. We talk about questions that may come up in the audition room and some tips on how to deal with that portion. Uh, we talk about how to say yes and in your audition rooms, how dance factors into their admission process, or in many cases doesn't factor in. Uh, and we talk about parental advice, how those stage moms got to let their kids write their own emails. But before we jump into the episode... Oh my, it's October. Uh, we just had a great second mock audition of the year. Really fantastic work by the students I saw. Uh, it's always just so uplifting to see that kind of passion and perseverance, especially through so many challenges of the past few years. These students have just fought through so much and have fought on. And just, you know, seeing them diving in and challenging themselves vulnerably to get better, it's just always such a thrill, and I, I love those days. For those of you who asked about my vacation, it was lovely. Uh, I got to watch one of my dear friends get married, as well as hike some gorgeous mountains in Colorado with a happy baby on my shoulders. Uh, there was one hike where just as we were getting to the top, and I'm like having a full-on heart attack, doing what was like a moderately difficult hike, but you know, I've got a baby on my back, and so if I falls completely asleep on my shoulders. So there's just like this picture with the juxtaposition of like me pouring sweat and her just in a gentle snooze. Uh, what a metaphor for parenthood that is. Uh, and Ian and I had a great time in general. Um, if anyone's saying it in the Golden, Colorado area, message me. I have a great Airbnb for you. I'm not kidding. She was wonderful. Um, well, we've started talking about Airbnbs, so I think it's time to get into this episode with Rebecca Kupka Overton from Malloy Cap 21. Well, we are honored to be joined by Rebecca Kupka Overton today from Malloy Cap 21. Uh, Rebecca has a degree, a BA in English and theater from Providence College. Um, she was on Broadway in Jersey Boys and national tours of 42nd Street and Chorus Line. She does lots of voiceover work. She and her husband created Long Island Classic Stage Company and Classic Kids. And she is now the theater arts recruitment coordinator for Malloy Cap 21 which is located in New York. They have class sizes of about 32 to 36 students, and they offer a BFA in theater arts, which is focused in musical theater. And we'll talk a little bit about the degree itself maybe today as well. They have also for the past few years participated in MTCA walk-ins, which were a delight. And it is such a delight to welcome Rebecca on the pod today. How are you doing? Hi, Charlie. Thank you so much for having me. I had forgotten that I gave you my bio. I'm like, wow, he knows so much about me. He did research. I'm like, oh, no, wait. How did he learn this? <laughs> yes. Always do your research, folks. <laughs> Before we jump too much into sort of Cap 21 today, I'd love to just do a little brief history of Cap 21 and its journey and as as well as you know it and your affiliation with it from sort of um, the NYU when it used to be part of NYU to now. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about that. Oh, sure. So, yeah, most people, I think, uh, were familiar with CAP21 from the NYU days. CAP21, um, 
probably some of you who are listening know that uh, NYU has a studio system. And I don't know that it's exactly the same now, but my understanding is that, you know, back in the day, Cap 21 was the musical theater studio at NYU. And that was for for many years, like starting in the mid 90s, I think. And it's about 25 years that it was with uh, NYU Tisch. And then in uh, 2011, Cap 21 uh, broke away from NYU um, because at the time, and this is the part that I'm not quite sure about, at the time, the studios were sort of independently owned and operated. Mm-hmm. The way I think of it is more like an independent contractor. Mm-hmm. So Cap 21 was administrated, had like business owners, but the parent college was NYU Tisch School of the Arts. And it was some financial issue that Cap didn't feel that they were being funded adequately by the university. Um, so Cap Um, moved out on its own uh, as a a two-year conservatory, like a pre-professional program. But because it was no longer with NYU, it was a non-degree granting program Mm -hmm. for maybe two or three years. But that's sort of a hard sell in New York City um, because the cost was still fairly comparable to college tuition, but you weren't getting an actual degree. Right. You make it like a certificate at the time. Exactly. You get like a musical, a certificate in musical theater performance or something like that. So long story longer, the uh, president of Molloy College, uh, just who recently just retired, his name was uh, Drew Bogner. His son was a Broadway producer who would go see things at Cap 21 because during that time, Cap also had a conservatory, um, along with the conservatory, it had a, um, a theater program. So they would do like new works. They would do Uh, performances of new works. So a lot of Broadway producers were going to kind of check out Cap's new works. And um, uh, Drew's son, Ryan, uh, saw that uh, Cap 21 was actually looking or considering partnering with another college Mm -hmm. and thought that that would be a really great idea. He brought that to his dad. And uh, in 2014, Malloy partnered with Cap 21 for about a year. They kept the two de- the, the two year degree, or mm-hmm. rather the two year certificate, and then the four year degree. But that was a little confusing. That was like a little messy, I think. Um, so ultimately, Malloy College bought Cap 21. Those owners went away, and uh, it is now the Malloy Cap 21 program. It's not a separate entity. Sometimes students and parents are a little confused mm-hmm. by that because it did used to be a separate entity, but now it is a part. It is a a major at Malloy College, which is soon to be Malloy University as of, I think, June 30th this year. Uh, Malloy College is becoming Malloy University. But we are in our, going into our ninth year, 20, uh, 2023 will be the ninth year of um, the Malloy Cap 21 major. I think very well explained. And, you know, I think it is, as all of these colleges and especially conservatory style programs within colleges, we sometimes talk about there is almost an antithetical relationship. There is almost that separate relationship of, you said independent contractor, but sometimes it is like a separate entity working within the school, sometimes yes. very integrated from school to school. It can, yep. can really vary, but that's a great example of it was literally a separate entity. Oh, it was literally, it, it was in a different integrated. area of New York City. It was so separate. I, I think it worked very well for many, many years. And I don't, that was way before my time. So I don't know all of those ins and outs, but um, mm-hmm. um, interestingly, many of the professors who were with CAP 21 during the NYU days are still with us. Mm -hmm. So I think it speaks to the integrity of the program and the mission of CAP 21. I I did not know this for two years after I started in this position. CAP 21 stands for Collaborative Arts Project for the 21st Century. Mm. I had no idea it stood for anything, which is pretty funny. As, you know, the head of recruitment, it's like, oh, look, it's an acronym. How nice. <laughs> Two years later. So <laughs> so I, I think that the um, the collaborative part, you know, the mm-hmm. mission of CAP 21 has always been to be a collaborative training program wherein the professors and the students really work together on the journey of the education and the training, as opposed to it being a real hierarchy of, you know, the professors are here and the students are there and never the twain shall meet. You know, mm-hmm. it, it is it is very much um, an integrated communicative program. Um, and I think that that is why our professors have stayed for as long mm-hmm. as they have. In fact, our head of acting, Larry Arancio, um, he's stepping down as head of acting um, just 
essentially retiring, but he's still going to teach. But he's been mm-hmm. the head of acting probably since like the late nineties. Hmm. So, you know, we, we have a, we have, a, and a lot of our professors um, and instructors are actually former cap 21 students. So there's a real kind of family feel in the program um, kind of from the top down people come back. And I think that that again, speaks really highly to the training, you know, that, that, that our uh, former students want to come back and teach and kind of be a part of, you know, teaching the new generation. And let's get into that training a little bit. So, so tell me, especially from like freshman, sophomore, junior, senior year, let's talk about like, what does the musical theater training look like? If I come in and I'm ready to be a collaborative artist, I'm ready to have that family experience. How am I going to, how am I going to grow and change over those four years? (laughs) Yeah, no, that's it. It's just a family experience. There's no training. (laughs) (laughs) Kidding. Sorry. So yeah, it's, it's a really scaffolded program. I, I think that our curriculum having kind of done some research myself, um, you know, and also, you know, having become very friendly with heads of programs, you know, in other schools, I I would argue that, you know, the CAP 21 program has one of the best curriculums out there, the one of the most thorough um, in terms of musical theater training. I think that some schools place an emphasis on one or the other, you know, they're uh, maybe a little bit voice heavy or dance heavy or acting heavy. Um, I just in terms of your coursework as a Malloy Cap 21 student, you will have a real balance of singing, dancing and acting. The degree itself, this can sometimes be confusing. I won't even go into why this is. This is something I have, you know, kind of argued about over the years, but I understand where it came from. The degree is theater arts, but it is purely a triple threat musical theater training program. Mm -hmm. What's confusing is that sometimes when acceptances go out, students think, oh, I got redirected into the theater program. No, it's the only program that we have. It is the CAP 21. Theater arts is the title of the degree, but it is a pure musical theater training program. It has to do with the fact that Malloy had a theater degree before. So they mm -hmm. basically just reactivated that as opposed to applying for a whole new degree through the state of New York. And what that does mean is, so if if I'm only interested or I'm more interested in one of the stools of that um, three-legged, mm-hmm. or one of the legs of the, legs. the three-legged stool well, yeah. of musical theater, does that mean that Malloy is maybe not the program for me? If I'm really mostly an actor who kind of sings or I'm mostly a dancer, does it mean it's like, hey, I actually really want triple threats? No, no, actually not. That That is, that's a very good question because I think that the sort of the balance of the training really does a great job of balancing that by the time our students graduate, we are graduating real triple threats. You don't have to come in as a true triple threat. We expect that most students, you know, most 16, 17 year old students, of course you have something that you are most comfortable with. You know, Mm -hmm. I mean, it has everything to do with, you know, where in the country you grew up, what kind of training you have had access to. And you know, in, in many ways, it's 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 simply not fair to compare um, a, a young student who has had access to, you know, excellent dance training, private voice lessons. Maybe they live near a professional theater, an equity theater, and they've had just tons of immersive work simply because of where they live in the country. Then you have another student who might have amazing raw talent, but has never really studied voice. Maybe there isn't any dance studio in their Mm -hmm. town or, you know, and, and so what my job is, is to really look for students who have raw ability, you know, who have the potential to become successful triple threat musical theater performers. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways that we sort of navigate that, um, our dance program, for example, is completely leveled. So we do offer a dance audition. Now, this is all pre-COVID. Post-COVID, everything has been, you know, a little up in the air, as you might imagine, and has been the case, I think, with, with other schools as well. But we, in general, offer the opportunity for students who are dancers to show us that either in an in-person audition or via uh, dance videos that they can Uh, choose to submit. But if you're not a dancer, that's okay. I always encourage students to submit even a movement video, just even their dance pre-screen, just to kind of show Mm -hmm. us where they are. It will not hurt you if you're not a strong dancer. It will only help you if you are a strong dancer. Mm -hmm. 
if that makes sense. But then once you arrive at Malloy Cap 21, once you have been accepted into the program, um, within your first week of classes, we do placements. They're not auditions. They're just simply to see where are you right now as a singer, dancer, actor. You will sing for the uh, voice faculty. You will do uh, a jazz combination and a ballet combination for the dance faculty. And we even level that. Like we'll we'll break down those into three separate rooms. Like we're not gonna have the ones who have been doing you know competitive dance since they were two, learning the same combination as the kids who have only really done choreography in their school musical. And like, mm-hmm. oh, I'm, I'm really very comfortable with step touch and that's about it. That's totally cool. We'll even break, those students down and teach them modified combinations just so we can kind of see where everybody is. But once you get to Molloy Cap 21, and once you have been sort of placed in the section, the the area that you, where your strengths are, our goal is to kind of continue to um, build those skills that you already have, you know, really capitalize on the strengths that you're coming to us with, but also maybe bring up those other areas where you may not feel quite so comfortable so that at the very least, we are graduating incredibly strong actors with amazing voices who either move extremely well or who can, you know, kick their face and, you know, go to a dance call first. And we have I hear you on both. the little like capitalize. That was good. That was good. Capitalize. Capitalize. Like, totally See what I did there? You know what? Okay, oh, you're better than I am. I'm like, I would pretend that I said that on purpose, but um, <laughs> but just to I need clear, another the, cup of coffee the, for that. <laughs> if I'm truly only interested, let's say I'm just interested in acting or I'm just interested in dance, the sure. theater arts degree is really a musical theater degree it in is. terms of- Yes, yeah, so, it is. Because some programs, the, to your point, the theater arts thing might mean a larger- broader view of theater. But for you, it really is a musical theater It really degree. is a musical theater degree. And that that is actually a really great point that you bring up, um, you know, not to sell students away from our school, but I, particularly for the students who are listening, who are young students, maybe rising sophomores, juniors, rising seniors, don't discount a Bachelor of Arts degree. The mm-hmm. BFA degree, a Bachelor of Fine Arts, tends to be much more specific, whether it's a BFA in musical theater, a BFA in dance, a BFA in acting. That's going to be a real focused performance-based degree, whereas a Bachelor of Arts can offer students, in many cases, the opportunity to double major, um, can also offer students the opportunity to kind of dabble in mm-hmm. lots of different areas in theater. I often have students who, you know, say that they're, you know, really interested in maybe costume design too, and they they like theater. They 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 really like acting. They're mm-hmm. not so sure about dancing, and 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 that's all good. You know, I think in many cases, um, a bachelor of arts degree can provide a really great, well-rounded study of theater, Mm -hmm. a broad study of theater where you sort of pick and choose what performance areas you want to dabble in and experience. The BFA degree is really more for students who are like, this is what I want to do. I want Mm -hmm. this hardcore performance-based training in whatever this entity is. And at Malloy Cap 21, that is musical theater. Like you can't come to Cap 21 and just take the acting classes. Mm -hmm. The degree itself is very much balanced with singing, dancing, and acting. Well, now can we get super nerdy? Just because now you've you've piqued my interest. I want to go down this path just (laughs) because at some point on this pod, I wanted to explain this to people and who better than you to do this. Can we talk a little bit of like how that accreditation works in terms of like, so why a degree might say, I have a BFA in drama with a concentration in acting or a concentration in musical theater from Carnegie Mellon, this is. But like, yep. how, how, why schools sometimes call it theater, theater arts, what, like how that works in terms of what it is to register for a BFA and what you have to register for it in. Because I think sometimes that's really confusing. We sometimes are a little sloppy. We call them BFAs in musical theater and acting on the pod just to help yep. uh, clarify, even though a lot of those degrees are actually BFAs in theater and performance with a specialization in acting or yep. different you know, names. Or sometimes it. they're like a bachelor of music in musical Correct. theater, like a BM in musical theater. You know, So these are all, part of it has to do with, like you said, with accreditation. It has to do with how the degree is registered with the college in that particular state. There are different, you know, with the Board of Education in whatever state the college is located in. Um, But just as, you know, in layman's terms, what I have found, and I, I, I can't say that I'm an absolute expert in this in any way, but 
The way that I sort of differentiate is that a BFA degree tends to have, and I encourage students to really look at the curriculum, at the credits that you'll be taking. For example, at Malloy Cap 21, you will take 40 credits of uh, general education classes. So those gen ed classes are going to be what you would expect, you know, in the realm of um, English, history, math, science, your, your, your academic courses, if you will. Your musical theater courses, uh, it's 76 credits. So almost double mm -hmm. the amount of credits will be taken in the studio format. And those are going to be your singing, dancing, and acting classes. Some of them are lecture-based. You know, you'll have history of musical theater. You'll have um, music theory. You'll have harm harmonics and sight singing, class piano, um, script analysis. But then you'll also have, you know, ballet every year, jazz, hip-hop, tap, um, you know, real hands-on training type courses. Uh, just, just from personal experience, I went to Providence College, uh, which is a liberal arts school. It is not a conservatory school. And I didn't even start out as a theater major, actually. I, I started out um, with an interest in pre-med. And, and then I ended up just deciding that organic chemistry might kill me. And so <laughs> not wanting to, you know, die at 19 years old, I decided, okay, let's, let's do something that's going to be a little bit more uh, comfortable for me. So I switched to an English major. And then I was taking so many theater classes just for fun, like for my electives, that my advisor was like, well, basically, you just need to take this, this and this, and you'll have mm -hmm. a double major. But only maybe three or four of those courses in the theater arts BA at Providence College had to be studio classes. Mm -hmm. If I had wanted to, all the rest of them could be lecture-based courses. So mm -hmm. that's really what the difference is, is that the BFA, and I think also like the BM, the Bachelor of Music, that's going to be more hands-on, more intense. Um, and when you hear the word concentration, I think that's sort of just, you know, where where your focus can be. Some schools do offer, you know, a bachelor of whatever, bachelor of arts in theater arts with a concentration in, that's probably going to be more of those studio studio mm -hmm. courses. Totally makes sense. And, and unfortunately, no unifying language of drama means this, theater means this, performance means, musical theater means this. It's not necessarily that much more musical because it's got the word music in it, you know. No, all those I think it really music. does depend. I think it really does depend on the school. And I think that those are the those are the great questions to ask, you know, for students who are really just starting their search, you know, asking around and, and asking current students like what mm -hmm. most most of the schools have, you know, if you go to their Web page, you should be able to find a copy, you know, uh, on one of their little tabs of their curriculum. Mm -hmm. And I always encourage students to really take a look at what those courses are, how they are laid out over the four years. And that can really help you to get a sense of, you know, how studio based, how conservatory based this program is versus one that's going to be a little bit more academic. And let's get into that with, with Malloy specifically in terms of um, so that they could spend some days, it seems like, in you know a little bit outside the city at Malloy. They spend some days in the city itself, like in the heart of uh, New York City, um, taking those studio classes. How does that work in terms of um, the balance of, of how much? You sort of said credit wise, but how does that work in terms of days and hours? That yeah, that, 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 that's that actually much more easier to understand from, from a day-to-day -day kind of day-in-the-life perspective. So our first-year students will spend and two full days in New York City at the Manhattan Center. So the Manhattan Center is um, located at 50 Broadway. It's in the financial district down by the the bull, the, the raging bull. Um, you know, for those of you who are familiar with New York City, it's by a block away from Wall Street, from the Stock Exchange, uh, very close to Statue of Liberty, South Ferry. It's a really beautiful area. And we are on the fourth floor of 50 Broadway, and we actually only opened that facility in 2019. So it's it's brand new studios and they were not used for, you know, six months during the pandemic. So we've only really been in there for like two and a half years running classes, you know, continuously. Um, so our first year students will spend Mondays and Wednesdays in New York City and classes are generally generally about 10 o'clock in the morning until about five o'clock in the evening. So it's a real sort of 
intense day, it's set up sort of like um, like an equity rehearsal. You know, you have your set lunch break. Everyone gets at least an hour lunch break. You'll have, you know, 10 minute breaks usually in between classes. Um, and you will spend the entire day acting, singing, and dancing in some combination, depending on how your section is laid out. Then on those opposite days, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, you'll be on the Malloy main campus, which is in Rockville Center. That is a suburb of New York City. It is, you know, as the crow flies, it's 26 miles from New York City. But anyone who lives in New York City knows that that could take, you know, hours by car. <laughs> so we highly recommend the train. And that is uh, that's how our students actually get to and fro from from the two campuses. Generally, our first year students live on the main campus. That's where the dorms are. Mm -hmm. So they're in Rockville Center. Um, there is a shuttle, a, a shuttle van, a shuttle bus uh, that operates continuously on a set schedule from the Malloy campus that brings uh, our students and anyone else who needs to go into New York City, uh, some of our faculty come back and forth to the Long Island Railroad Rockville Center train station. It's about five minutes down the road. You could walk it, but most people don't want to do that when they're on their way to class. So it's a real quick ride. And then uh, it drops you right at the Long Island Railroad train station. Um, the That's our commuter rail for those of you who are you know outside of New York City. It's it's a train, not a subway. And most of our you know Long Island commuters use the Long Island Railroad to get in and out. So it's very well-traveled. It's very safe. And then our students uh, zip into Penn Station. It's about 35 minutes um, if you get an express train, which our students often do in the morning. And uh, Penn Station is one of the main transportation hubs in New York City. And uh, you'll come you don't even have to leave the building. You actually go up two flights of steps, even though that seems counterintuitive, but you're going up to the subway and um, you'll get on the one, two or three, which is the red line in New York City, the subways. And um, that will just take you right down to uh, either Wall Street or Rector Street, depending on which train you're on. And then it's a one block walk from either side. So the whole trip takes about an hour hour and 15 minutes, you know, if the trains don't connect properly, which again, anyone who lives in New York, you know, you got to live, build in a little bit of time because <laughs> you can never count on the MTA to be, to do what you wanted to do when you needed to do it. So, and then at the end of the day on Mondays and Wednesdays, you just do that all in reverse out to the main campus. So you're not going back and forth between the two campus multiple times a day. It's mm -hmm. either a city day or a Long Island day. And when you're um, on your Long Island days, that's going to be a real nice mix of musical theater classes and academic classes. So it's a popular misconception is that you're only doing musical theater two days a week as a freshman, mm -hmm. but that's not true. You're, you're doing musical theater all five days. It's just more intense on Mondays and Wednesdays. And then Tuesday, Thursday, Friday is going to be maybe a sociology class in the morning, your private voice lesson and movement for the actor, something mm -hmm. like that. It's going to feel a little bit more like a typical college campus experience. And tell me a little bit about that typical college camp experience of Malloy College, now Malloy University, maybe by the time they're listening to this. Yep. <laughs> but tell me a little bit about like, what is the campus like? What is the, what are the opportunities academically that I have at Malloy? Um, it's, you know, are there opportunities to potentially minor if I'm, you know, look, getting a theater arts BFA? What kinds of, you mentioned sociology, but what kinds of classes could I be taking at Malloy alongside? Yeah, class? absolutely. So um, uh, Malloy is a a mid-sized, considered a mid-sized college, soon to be university. We have about 5,000 students, undergraduate and graduate. Some of our most popular majors besides the musical theater program, um, nursing, music therapy, um, business, those are all nationally recognized programs. And we do get students from outside of the region, particularly for those programs. Interestingly, Malloy started as an all-female nursing college, started by Dominican nuns in the 1960s, um, which was really progressive, you know, to have a Catholic nursing college for all women started by nuns, you know. Mm. For, for folks who are Catholic, you can probably see how pretty progressive in the 60s to have a Catholic school specifically for women, specifically for nurses, started by nuns. <laughs> so, um, you know, over the years, Malloy has really exploded. It, only a commuter school until uh, 2010. And our first dorm was built in 2010. We now have three uh, full-size dorms, and one of them was actually scheduled to open in the fall of 2020 during the pandemic. So it's 
it's open now, but it was, you know, it's only been open for, you know, about a year. So it's literally a brand new building. And um, uh, I think that, you know, just, just the growth of this really, you know, tiny college into, you know, a more regional recognized college and now becoming a university um, in order to become a university, you have to have a certain number of graduate programs and, mm-hmm. you know, there's all sorts of stuff that goes into that. You have to apply. So the fact that, you know, Malloy has been recognized with university status, I think is a testament to the growth of the college slash university itself. Um, you asked earlier if students can minor. Absolutely. We have a list of a very extensive list of minors, um, about 35 programs, I think that, that, students can take advantage of. And I would say maybe at least 50% of our musical theater students do choose to minor. Hmm. And it doesn't have to be in a kind of correlated program. Many of our students do uh, minor in music simply because several of the courses overlap and they count Mm -hmm. for both. So it makes a music minor very easy to complete, but we've had students minor in math. We've had students minor in physics, um, certainly in, in, uh, like marketing, business management, communications, that's another easy one. Um, but really anything that you have an interest in, uh, the most important thing that as an incoming student, you just let your advisor know you're going to have an academic advisor. You're also going to have an artistic advisor. Hmm. So the academic advisor, both are, are CAP 21 faculty members, but one of them is going to really help guide your um, academic journey, making sure that you are registering for the classes that you need in order to graduate in four years. Um Particularly if you're minoring or if you're in the honors program, there are, there's like a, a more of a specificity about how that's laid out and you may have to take this particular class first semester, sophomore year, mm-hmm. and your advisor will say, because otherwise it won't come around again and, and you're not going to be able to do it. You won't be able to fit it in. So just listen to your advisor because they know what they're talking about. Um, and then your um, artistic advisor is going to help guide your artistic journey through the program. Not so much registering for classes. Those are more set. Your 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 uh, curriculum, your conservatory curriculum is pretty scaffolded and pretty set. Um, there are some electives, which I'll talk about in a second, but uh, your artistic advisor is really going to help you um, kind of navigate, um, you know, are you getting what you need from the program? How, how's it going? You know, mm-hmm. are you, are you, do you feel that you're connecting with the material? How's, how are things going with your professors? Do you feel like you are growing? Are you struggling in certain areas? What do you need? And, um, we are, it's really important to us that each of our students, um, is seen as an individual artist, as opposed to, you know, just a musical theater major. Because, you know, we really believe that each student who comes to us has the potential to be a unique artist. Yes, Mm. a musical theater performer, that's what you're here for. But, you know, what makes you tick? Like what we always say is, you know... um, you know you love musical theater. That's why you here. That's why you're here. You've already decided that. Now, what are you gonna do with it? What are you mm-hmm. gonna do with that mm-hmm. musical theater degree? How are you going to, how are you going to, you know, share your art? How are you going to make a difference, not only as a musical theater performer, but as a human being as well? You know, what makes you tick, and why do you do what you do? And that's really kind of like the nitty gritty of what your artistic advisor is really going to help you figure out, you know, your artistic, your journey as an artist, if that makes sense. Totally makes sense. Um, you mentioned you want to talk a little bit about electives, and then I also want to get into, so hit me with that, but then also I want to get a little into kind of how you prepare students for their launch into the business. So I'd love to hear kind of senior year and beyond, what do we do oh, sure. um, from there into the the showcase and, and beyond? Mm-hmm. So um, just backing up just a little bit, um, there are not a ton of electives in the musical theater program because it is so tightly packed. You're, you're, you're getting so much studio work. I, I mean, I, I, our students are um, on the edge of overwhelm in a good way in terms of, you know, their musical theater training. You're getting everything that you need to really be successful, not just uh, with your technique, not just with your singing, dancing, and acting technique, but really with your um, with your preparation for how to actually the nuts and bolts of how to be a working actor in this business. But I'll I'll get to that in a sec. Um, 
in recent years, we have one of the things that I think that Cap 21 does very well is um, we, we adapt very well to what the industry is asking for today. Part of that is because we are in New York City. It's a lot easier to have your finger on the pulse of an industry when you're physically there. Um, certainly not impossible. Everyone knows there are amazing programs all over this country. You don't physically have to be in New York to get amazing training. I'm in no way saying that. But just one of the benefits of being in New York City is that the faculty, mm -hmm. all of them are actually able to continue working in the industry themselves. Our faculty are working professionals. They are writers. They are choreographers, directors. They're performing. They're in Broadway shows at night. They'll teach a class during the day. They'll you know, go uptown for their eight o'clock curtain that night. So they, they are literally doing this on a day-to-day -day basis. So as the industry kind of grows and changes and morphs, um, we get to sort of see that firsthand. Um, and in, I would say in the past five years, which I think is a really good, um, good progression, I've, I have found that students are becoming more and more interested in other areas in theater, they know that they want to major in musical theater. They know they want that triple threat training, but they're also interested in uh, playwriting. They're interested in directing. They're interested in stage management. They they sort of, they, they want to write their own musicals. They want to do student-driven work. And that has become a real theme in the questions that I have been getting over mm -hmm. the past. This is, I'm going into my sixth year as the head of recruitment here. So um, I would say like maybe two years into my tenure here, that's when those questions really started to ramp up. And I would argue that during the pandemic, you know, we all sort of had to pivot. I kind of mm -hmm. hate that word, but <laughs> I'm going to use it because it makes sense. It's like, what do we do? You know, our whole industry is shut down. So do we just give up on it and say, mm -hmm. well, we can't do this anymore. So, you know, being innovative theater folk, like we all are, everyone kind of knows and saw what happened. You know, the, the, the virtual world has sort of exploded and I don't think that that's going to go away. Um, so because of that, We've added, we had already had a playwriting elective, um, a directing elective. We have a lot of dance in the program, but our students wanted more. So we added Saturday dance electives. Mm -hmm. It's only on Saturday because of space. Um, we are working on getting some more appropriate dance space on the main campus. Um, like I had said earlier, our, you know, studio space that was built for us is in New York City. Mm -hmm. But that makes it tricky because on the Long Island campus, there's only one space on the Long Island campus that's appropriate for dance. So mm -hmm. we would really love to get maybe one or two more uh, studio spaces that with sprung dance floors that we can offer some more dance electives on different days. Um, but as of right now, we have Saturday dance electives that um, beginning sophomore year, our students can register for that class every semester if they want to, I think up to six times. Hmm. So um, we've also added um, acting for the camera. That's not an elective that is has become part of since the pandemic that has become part of um, the actual curriculum. We always mm -hmm. had a unit on acting for the camera within the senior practicum sequence in senior year. But, you know, seeing as how being on camera has become such a, not just acting for the camera, but actually auditioning for musical mm -hmm. theater on the camera has become like a thing. And I don't think that that's going to go away. Mm -hmm. So there is now a three credit course acting for the camera, which includes all of that, you know, auditioning on zoom, all of that. Um, and, and I think that that is sort of a testament to, to uh, cap 21's ability to sort of morph and say, Hey, this is something that our students need now. It's not just an option, uh, optional skill. You got to have it. Mm -hmm. So things like that. And then yeah, tell me a little more about the connection to the industry with a showcase and, and all those kind of things. Sure. So senior year um, is really dedicated to, um, you know, you have all of this great training. You've got the vocal skill. You've got the dance skills. You've got the acting skills. Excuse me. How do you um, now, how do you put your best foot forward? You know, how do you 
how do you take those skills and present them to the world? You know, how do you talk to casting directors? How do you not talk to casting directors? How do you communicate with agents? How do you not communicate with agents? You know, it, it's really, you know, anybody who has been in this business knows that it can feel pretty arbitrary. Like, should I reach out? Should I contact them? Is that mm -hmm. appropriate? Is that inappropriate? And the fact of the matter is, is that casting directors and agents are human beings too. And I don't think that there is a set yes or no. Mm -hmm. Should I reach out? Should I not? But we can sort of give you an idea of like, how do we do this appropriately? Mm -hmm. at, the, at, the, at, the, at the very least, how do you get yourself out there in a way that is um, inviting and forward thinking and progressive without being too pushy, without being off putting. Mm -hmm. And that's really what our, what our goal is because, you know, as, as, as theater performers, there is a business side of it too. And that business part becomes m even more important, you know, upon graduation because you do have to kind of act as your own advocate. Um, you know, how do you get an agent? Maybe why do you not want an agent right away at 21 years old? You know, maybe you want to freelance. Maybe you don't want to sign with somebody. So these are all the things um, I mentioned earlier. Uh, we have a, a course. It's a whole semester, your senior year, second semester called Senior Practicum. Mm -hmm. And so in your Senior Practicum, that's where you're going to really talk about the nitty gritty, the nuts and bolts, your headshots and resumes, um, website development. Um, connecting with agents, connecting with, with, uh, casting directors, you know, all those sort of things that you need to kind of know how to do in order to get yourself out there. We also offer a series, a weekly series of master classes throughout the whole second semester senior year, where we bring in casting directors, agents, directors, choreographers, um, to work with our students. Sometimes it's a one and done, like, you know, like a two hour masterclass. Sometimes they'll come back for a series. You know, we've had um, Randy Skinner, who is a very well-known uh, tap choreographer in New York City. Randy will come in and teach for two or three weeks. He'll he'll teach some tap choreography for our seniors. And, and he'll actually get to kind of work with you on that audition technique. You know, how do you audition uh, for a tap musical? Um, and if you're auditioning for Randy Skinner, you'll realize that you have to do it one at a time. You tap one at a time for Randy Skinner. That is a skill that I will never get used to, even though I am a tapper. I'm like, you know, being in a room full of 50 women and you have to do the combination by yourself. Lippity I mean, talk clack, about nerve wracking. Clack, clack. Yep. Oh my gosh. It's like, he's really the only one that does that. But so we bring in Randy Skinner. We're like, here, let's do it by yourself. Mm. So, um, I, I think that, uh, you know, going back to what I had said earlier about um, being in New York City, one of the benefits of being in the city is that we can get a real variety of uh, directors, choreographers, casting directors, agents, because it's a quick subway ride for them to mm -hmm. come in and do a few master classes with us. Whereas, you know, a program that's in the middle of the country, they might be able to fly someone out for a weekend, mm -hmm. but they're not as, it's just not as convenient to mm -hmm. do that. So, and of course, we're not the only New York City school. There are other New York City schools as well that are able to do the same thing. It's simply a geographic thing. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, beginning your junior year as a Malloy Cap 21 student, um, your technique classes, your 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 vocal technique, uh, vocal mechanics, uh, vocal performance, um, those will sort of transition into audition technique, audition repertoire, building your book, mm -hmm. so that you you know you have this vocal technique. You can sing in golden age styles. You can sing in pop rock and contemporary Broadway. You've been working on that for two years, but then as you go into your into your junior year, um, we really transition more to your material and what pieces are going to be most suited for the roles that you are the most likely to book, like your wheelhouse, you know, so you have a solid book um, that you are, you know, you have 10 or 20 songs that you can kind of whip out at the drop of a hat and not only, you know, sing them really well, but act them really well 
also. Well, you're beginning a perfect segue. But before we segue into the audition process, which we're going to get into in a second, let's just take a short break. On the back end of that break, we'll get into the audition process, especially for Malloy Cap 21. It's up. Perfect. We really love MTCA kids because they're they're so well prepared, but they're human. Like the best part about MTCA students is that when they audition, they're doing stuff that they like. They're dressed in clothes that suit them. They they show us who they are right away. It's not it's not you know pageanty and like oh we're so well prepared and there's I I don't know what's going on behind those eyes. They're like real students you know that it's like hey this is what i have to offer i'm looking for a school you're looking for students if this is a good fit great if it's not let's help you find the fit and that's really like i sort of see myself more of like a yenta like a little bit of a matchmaker you know i'm i'm not of course i want students to come to malloy cap 21 of course there's a part of that as being you know in charge of recruitment i have to get students to come to the program but I'm not gonna drag students kicking and screaming to Malloy Cap 21. There are literally hundreds of programs out there and one of them is gonna be the fit for you. Mm -hmm. One of them is gonna be the one or there's gonna be two or three that are gonna be good fits that can work for you and also work for your finances. Like that's important too, you know? All of these things that go into it, but I know that students are gonna be in the best of hands at MTCA because you're not pushing them. It's not a money-making enterprise. It's not about, you know, let me take all of your money and who cares where you end up. It's like really, I feel like MTCA really shepherds students to the right program for them in to the best of their ability. You, 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 can't, you can't go wrong. You will be in the very, very best of hands. And I'm always so happy when I see MTCA mm. on resumes. I'm like, yay, I just know these students are in great hands. That is an incredibly sweet commercial we just got. And I was on the break. We're, but we are officially back with Rebecca Kupka Overton now. Um, and we're going to chat a little bit about, I'd love to hear in general what makes a good audition for you. So you sit and you see a lot of auditions. Um, you said you, you're a Yenta is sort of the <laughs> purpose of you behind the audition table. But tell me, like, what are you really looking for? What, what do you feel like? This is a great audition. This is going to be someone who I'm going to invite to come to Cap 21. Absolutely. So surprisingly, you, you, you may find this to be surprising. Talent is really secondary because at this point, of course, you have to have some basic skills, right? It's going to be really hard to get into a musical theater program if you're completely tone deaf. That's, you know, and I, and I say that, you know, kindly, that doesn't mean that you can't be a part of an acting program, you know, but for, um, you know, for musical theater, a, a good starting point is having um, a voice that is on pitch. You don't have to be one of those. You don't have to be, you know, ready for The Voice or American Idol. You don't have to. It's not about vocal gymnastics. It's not about these huge high notes. If you have them, great. If that's your strength, if you are comfortable with your voice, absolutely show me where your voice lives right now. Mm -hmm. Try to choose material that you feel as a student that you connect to, not just that you perform well, because, you know, there are some students like you might be able to perform Glitter and Be Gay well, you can mm -hmm. hit those notes, but you can't really, you don't really connect to it. It's mm -hmm. not, it's not a song that you enjoy singing. Don't sing that. I don't care. You'll be able, if you can hit those notes now, you'll be able to hit them later. Hmm. What I want to see is a journey. The most important thing to me is a sense of authenticity as a performer. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have had, you know, acting classes since you were five years old. Some of the most authentic performers have never taken an acting class in their life. Mm -hmm. they, they are students. They are 16, 17-year-old young people with a voice, with, with a point of view. And they're choosing material that enables them to tell even just a little bit of a story. Mm -hmm. Those are the best songs 
not the money notes, not belting your face off, not scrolling at me for 32 bars. I don't, I don't need to hear that. If you have that, great, cool. If you don't have that, I would much rather have a song that just shows me who you are, whether it's, it's comedy your thing. Do you like comedy? Do you want to be funny? Be funny. If you prefer to kind of, you know, tell an introspective, touching, poignant kind of story, tell me that, you know, and give me some contrast. If you do both, do both. But the material choice is important, but I'm not judging you on that. Let me be clear. Like I'm not, I'm not saying, oh, they should have found something that was more interesting. It's not at all about that. It's mm-hmm. does it show you as a performer where you are right now at 16 or 17 years old? That's what I want. I want to feel like this is a student that I can bring into the program who is ready to train, excited about learning. And who wants to grow. So I want students to really hear that. What that means to you as a student, you do not need to be perfect. If you if you crack, if your voice is raspy, if you forget the words of your monologue, I don't care. That's not, I am not, there is no black mark because mm. you didn't nail every little piece of this audition. It's not what it's about. I want to get to know you as a human being. I want to know in those 15 minutes, to the best of my ability, are you somebody that can come and play well with others? Mm-hmm. You have to be in a core in, in, in a core group. You have to be in a cohort for four years. Mm-hmm. Are you someone that is going to be a collaborative student? Are you someone who is going to build up and love your classmates, who's going to cheer on each, you know, the successes of the people around you? Or are you going to be the kind of person that is, you know, always trying to kneecap everybody else and has to be the best one? It's okay to be competitive. It's okay to strive to be your best, but not at the expense of your classmates. And that's what's really important to me. How do you see that in an audition? So that's something I think students have probably heard a couple of times. We really want someone who's going to be a good, great ensemble member. We want someone who's going to be collaborative, who's going to be supportive of, as a classmate. Certainly understand that from the college perspective, why that's uh, attractive. I, I am, if I'm walking in and I'm singing and dancing and acting all by myself for the most part, yeah. how do I show that in how an audition room? How in the world room? do you show that? Or, or are there any like red flags where you go, when I see this, this makes me think I am not that? Like, it, how, how are you sensing that out? I like to talk to students. Um, Whenever possible, I try to schedule 15 to 20 minutes blocks, uh, blocks of audition time so that we as a faculty have the opportunity to get to know you even for like three or four minutes. So it's like I said, yes, I want to see your I want to see your heart and soul in in your audition pieces. I want to see who you are. I want to see as little pretense as possible, as much honesty in your storytelling as possible. But then I want you to remember that I'm a human being behind the table. Talk to me. Tell me what you're interested in. Come with questions. If you don't have any, that's okay. We always say, you know, it's not a quiz. You don't have to have questions. Mm -hmm. But we do like to, you know, some of the questions that we will sometimes ask, you know, we'll say, um, if you had to pick two dream roles right now in your life, what might those be? That's a question that we'll sometimes ask. Mm-hmm. Um, we will sometimes ask, um, like I had mentioned before, you know, you, you know, you, why musical theater? You, mm-hmm. you, you decided to get a degree in musical theater. What is it about MT that speaks to you? Why, why are, mm-hmm. why are you choosing to pursue this for four years? Um, you know, questions that there is no right answer. The right answer is whatever, you know, the, the, one of the first rules of improvisation, you know, say the first thing that comes to your mind, say yes. And, you know, just speak, just talk like there's, we're not judging you. And I think that that can be so hard as a young auditioner mm-hmm. because we are behind the table and it does feel like you're being judged. And to some degree, we're assessing you. But I want students who come to me at Malloy Cap 21 to know that I'm not judging you. I'm not the worst I will say in my audition notes is, I don't think this is the right program for this student. Mm-hmm. I will never say, 
this kid needs to get out of the business because you're young. You, you, there's so much growth that can happen. And I believe that there is a program for everyone who wants to do this. Can you think of a specific example of an audition where the student was really exemplary, where you just wrote immediately, oh, yes, this is a yes. And if so, like, what about that audition was particularly noteworthy or makes you remember that audition? Oh, there have been so many. I mean, and for so many different reasons. But yeah, there there are one one that pops into mind, and I, I will share the student's name because I don't think that she would mind. She is one of my very, very first students. Her name is Sydney Fiesler. She is graduating tomorrow. She is one of our seniors. Shout out, Sydney. Oh, she's, she's how, how that girl has grown. But she was my first yes. Hmm. She was my first definite. And here's why. I met her in Texas and this young auburn haired woman, um, she, she came in and she just lit up the room with her authenticity. You know, she was, she had a beautiful voice. I mean, that, that didn't hurt. She had an absolutely crystal clear kind of mixy soprano belt, but she just was Sydney. She was easy to talk to. She kind of came in with this warm energy, like you wanted to talk mm. to her. You wanted to get to know her a little bit more. She just, she had this confidence that was like a quiet self-confidence. It wasn't cocky. It wasn't nervous. It wasn't, and it's not that you can't feel those things because we all do, but she just had this really honest presence. And, um, she came to audition for us again. She didn't have to, because that was considered a live pre uh, uh, a final audition, mm -hmm. but she really was interested in the program. So she came up to New York and auditioned for us again in New York and got to meet the rest of the faculty. And they felt the same way. She just, but here's what really did it. Our chair at the time, Henry Fonte, who has since retired, this was going back f almost five years ago. It was really before people started singing a lot of pop rock stuff. That has mm -hmm. really exploded in auditions in the past few years. Um, now we will even say, you know, bring a pop rock song with you. Like, I think students are a little more prepared. But back then, they had their two songs and that's it. And so I started putting it in the audition description because I was like, Henry, they're kids. They're not prepared with a pop rock song. Mm -hmm. They're learning that in college. Like, you know, and Henry's like, well, they should have a pop rock song. I'm like, but they're 16. They don't know. They don't have a book yet. <laughs> they, we asked them for 232 bar cuts. They came in with 232 <laughs> bar cuts. They're doing what they're supposed to do. And he was like, oh, all right. I'm like, you know, he had been musical theater chair in so many different departments. You know, you forget when you like that this is what students are learning in the four years. Anyway, he said to this girl, Sydney Fiesler, what pop songs do you have? And she's like, um, I don't think I have any music for any pop songs. And he said, well, what do you like to sing? And she said, um, well, I like Adele. And he glances over at the accompanist, who happened to be a phenomenal accompanist, just breaks into someone like you. Mm. And just starts playing, never mind, I'll find someone like you. Sydney just, without, without batting an eyelash, start, I heard that show. And she like, killed it mm. belting her face off and i'm like without without blinking an eye she was just like yeah sure i can sing that and i was like okay this is a yes it's a yes this I is a it. yes but it wasn't because she had an amazing voice she did but it was because she it, she it didn't throw her she was mm -hmm. like yeah sure let's have fun with it she didn't care she forgot the words it didn't it didn't matter it was like she was ready to go for it this is a kid that was ready to say yes and like mm. that's what being in a bfa program is about. Like, sure, teach me. No, I don't know how to do that. Show me how to do it. Mm -hmm. Give me the tools. And she just exemplified that. And now she's graduating tomorrow. Hmm. I'm amazing. And if you, now for, for you, if, if it's a de definite yes on your end, how does that work with Malloy and admissions in terms of, do you get all of the yeses that you say yes to? Do they have to pass some standards or how does that work in terms of the, the green light from you and then the actual admission from the school? That's a great question. So I actually evaluate the students academically as well. So my my position is a I have found a very strange position. Mm -hmm. um, 
I don't think it really exists at most schools. And I'm really kind of grateful that I ended up in this position. Um, most schools, it's actually very separate. The faculty does the artistic side and admissions does the admission side. Mm -hmm. But because I am sort of in admissions, but also in the theater department, I adjudicate all the talent, but I also, I'm the one reading their common apps. Mm -hmm. I'm the one reading their essays and, you know, evaluating, I recalculate their GPA. And um, it's certainly not, there are some programs, like I think you, Michigan, Carnegie Mellon, um, there might be a couple of other ones out there where your academics, like you, um, NYU, I think is a little harder to get into academically. Most musical theater programs are really more interested in your musical theater potential, less interested in your academics. And that is true at Malloy. Um, it's not particularly difficult to get accepted academically as a musical theater student to Malloy. Um, but I will say, um, that the higher your academics, the higher your grades, if you take, we are test optional, um, and we are staying test optional for 2022, 2023, from mm -hmm. what I understand, that was a kind of a recent decision. But if you take the SAT and or the ACT and do well on it, definitely submit it because that can sort of like your dance video that will only kind of help you, mm -hmm. um, it can help you with scholarship money. I have seen students with high SAT or ACT scores um, kind of securing more merit money based mm -hmm. on that just because it's another um, it's another data point. You know, it's another another way for admissions to sort of I don't do the scholarships. That's that's something that probably best that I don't because I would have everybody coming for free. I'd be like, <laughs> yes, you're so talented. You don't have to pay anything. <laughs> and yeah, that would be a problem. I'd probably lose my job. So I don't actually handle the money, but I do get to, to read all the essays and I do get to, um, uh, the only reason that a student would be, um, rejected academically from the school, they'd have to have really struggled during high school. And mm -hmm. even then there have been a couple of students that had pretty low grades, but they are so talented that I'm able to sort of fight for them. Um, there's a program at Malloy that's worth mentioning called the STAP program. It's called the St. Thomas Aquinas program. That, that, that's what it stands for, STAP. Um, and that is a program specifically for students who maybe struggled a little bit academically in high school. Um, and uh, they might need a little bit of extra support. So it is, you would be accepted as a STAP student. And what that means is that you automatically have a network of advisors and um, academic support through the college to really help you with those academic gen ed classes. And it really is a great program. There's a staff advisor, you have to interview uh, to be accepted through that program. And um, that's different than students who have disabilities. Specifically, you don't necessarily have to be in the staff program. There's a separate office for disability support. But for a student who struggles academically, mm -hmm. um, uh, the the STAP program can be a, a really good option to come in, you know, into the musical theater program through the STAP program. And you mentioned this already, I think, a little bit that in terms of admission from the musical theater perspective, um, it seems like dance is, is not a factor except a positive factor. So you're not doing a, an evaluative, or you're not maybe being dinged if you're not as strong of Correct. a dancer. So you, you are evaluating their acting and their singing, and then the dance is sort of more of a bonus of the, the legs of the stool in terms of the admission, at least? Yep, in terms of the admission, yes. Um, I suppose... In all fairness, that could change going forward. We are finding that as we want to add more dance to the program and as students are really coming to us with more interest in dance, it may, if and when we are able to secure the amount of space that we would like to require that level of dance in the program, we may change that. But mm -hmm. as of right now, yes. The dance is really considered a bonus point, and it we it will not hurt you. Um, when we have in person dance calls, we did not do that this year because of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but in the past, when we have in person dance calls, we encourage everybody to come, even if you are just a mover and really are not terribly adept, 
what it does is it gives us more time in the room with you. Mm -hmm. It gives us time to see, yeah, this kid is not a fantastic dancer, but he or she, you know, really had fun with that choreography and did their best to, you know, pick it up. And, you know, they, the whole middle section, they couldn't really do technically, but they had a blast with it. That's a yes for us. That's, mm -hmm. that, that's a positive, you know, mm -hmm. like it's not about, cause we're confident that we can teach that dance technique. We're confident that we can, at the very least, it's not a dance BFA. So, you know, not every student that is graduating from Malloy Cap 21 is going to consider themselves a dancer first. But we have students who have come to us with very little dance training who graduate and go to dance calls first because they are that confident with their dance. I love it. Um, you mentioned a little bit about sort of some of the pivots you made during the pandemic. Um, in the the 2023 audition season, are you keeping virtual auditions? Are you are you doing some in person, some virtual? How's that going to work? I think we're going to keep hybrid. Um, we haven't actually discussed it, but we discussed it last year. We could have done all in person. By the time auditions started, everything really was opened up again. Um, so we didn't really have too many restrictions. But depending on where students were in the country, there were still some restrictions. There was a, certainly a... Um, a, a very varied comfort level with COVID mm -hmm. in different in individual families and communities. But just more, I think more importantly, the fact that we can audition online um, really opens up the pool of talent to students who maybe can't afford to fly all the way across the bloody country to audition mm -hmm. for 20 different programs. I mean, let's be honest, it's an expensive process. And I mm -hmm. think that Zoom um, you know, virtual auditions has really leveled the playing field in a great way because it shouldn't just be for students who can afford everything, who can mm -hmm. afford all of the coaching and all of the traveling and going to every single campus. That becomes discriminatory in a way against students who don't have those resources, um, you know, who don't have the, maybe the family members to come with them. You know, it's, it's like everyone's family situation and financial situation is so different that I, I don't, I think that we have to sort of start to dismantle um, inadvertent elitism if that's yep. a word that I that I just con just uh, coined. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I'd love to talk a little bit about that. So, in terms of you know specifically the past couple of years, there's been a lot of demands for racial equity on different programs and and you know equity in general. As Cap Twenty One and Malloy have wrestled with those conversations, have there been adjustments over the past couple of years, or where are you right now with those conversations? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I. I preface everything, you know, being a Caucasian woman, there are things that I understand, certainly. There are things that I can only sympathize with and not empathize with. But what I can say is that as a department and and the faculty share this frequently, we are listening. You know, we want to hear how our students are doing, you know, what is important to them particularly our students of color, um, students in marginalized communities. We, some of our ongoing initiatives, I think, I think it's important to think of it as ongoing and not something that is, you know, sort of checked off and okay, we've done this and now we are, you know, officially the perfect department. I don't think that exists. What the chair of our department, his name is Chris O'Connor. He's really fantastic. Um, Chris always says, you know, we are working toward being an anti-racist, anti-bias department. We want, we want to really embody that. And some of those initiatives include um, anti-racism training sessions and workshops for faculty, staff, students. Um, we're adding uh, annual intimacy training for all students, faculty, and staff. We have really upped our hiring um, uh, of diverse faculty members. Just in the past year, we hired uh, 13 new uh, BIPOC faculty members. And, you know, not so much to throw numbers at you, but if and when we have the opportunity to offer a position, whether it's, you know, a guest artist position as a director or a choreographer or a, you know, full-time position, we are really actively looking for um, uh, faculty 
to increase that diversity so that our students see themselves represented across mm -hmm. the faculty. Um, I'm very pleased that our diversity as a student body has really increased. Um, Malloy's diver Malloy College, I think that the college reflects more of the community of Long Island. It is a much more um, balanced and diverse community um, than perhaps the musical theater department mm -hmm. on the whole. But just over the past several years, we really have been pleased to welcome um, many more BIPOC students into the program. And that it's a tricky thing because this is something that I will explain from my perspective. And I hope that this will maybe be helpful to your students who are listening to this. Um, overall, let's just say I see a hundred students. Mm -hmm. Let's on a fair side, let's say 70% of those students are white. Maybe 30% of those students are students of color. Maybe that's, that's, that's a lot. Maybe it's more like 80, 20. Mm -hmm. So right away, the amount of students that we are seeing come into auditions who are students of color is already so much lower. So then when it comes time to making acceptances, we are obviously not accepting simply because of a, a student's, you know, ethnic background, we want that student to be a good fit for our program as well. So we're not going to accept every single student. So now we've now we've like lowered it down to maybe 10 students that we can offer acceptances to. And those students are going to have lots of different options. They're not all going to come to Malloy Cap 21. Mm -hmm. So when you are looking at different programs and seeing their kind of um, diversity breakdown, I, I I can't speak for every single program, but I encourage students to know that programs are really, really trying. We are really actively trying to, you know, welcome the most balanced cohorts that we possibly can. But sometimes it is out of our hands simply because of the disparity between, you know, the number of Caucasian students versus the number of students of color who are actively trying to audition for these programs. So that can be that can be a little bit tricky too and I think that that's a bigger issue. That's a that's a larger issue than just the programs, the BFA programs. Totally, it's, yeah. it's, it's it's an issue of, you know, do students even see themselves in this profession? And if they don't, why not? And how do we change that? That's a bigger conversation. Yeah. We, we've talked about that a lot of sort of the point of the pipeline where this is yes. happening is not necessarily at 17, 18 years old. It's not necessarily at the admissions process as much as it's something that is, uh, you know, needs to be fixed uh, farther along down the pipeline, far, earlier yes. in the, yeah. And I'm seeing changes. I mean, I have to say, I, I think in the past just two or three years, we have had a much more balanced audition pool. Mm -hmm. Still nowhere near what we would consider equal, you know, but it is, it, I think it is reflective of the industry changing and mm -hmm. that makes me happy. Um, you know, there, so, so we are, we are, we are continuing to kind of work on, um, you know, one of the things that I think is really important is that um, we have really looked at our curriculum in terms of, you know, musical theater is a very white male dominant curriculum you know when we're talking mm -hmm. about golden age musicals that was the white male canon you know mm -hmm. it we can't really change what went before but what we can do instead of saying well we're not going to study that we're going to ignore that rogers and hammerstein ever happened we can't do that and be a balanced well-rounded musical theater performer in terms of knowledge but what we can do is contextualize it and you know explain to the best of our ability, you know, what was going on in the historical context at that time. And then going forward, it's about, you know, choosing material, choosing scenes, choosing plays, actively seeking, you know, playwrights of color, um, you know, playwrights from the LGBTQ community, um, and and trying to to put forth their work as part of the what the new canon is turn that into like the new curriculum so that it becomes just more accepted as opposed to this only the white men write it and mm -hmm. the, you know and I, you know what i'm saying i'm <laughs> 
I, <laughs> once I go down this rabbit hole, I'm like, blah, 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 right. blah. it could almost the kids be are a like, three hour more zone podcast. Out. <laughs> I know it could be its own podcast. Yeah. Um, I'd love to end with just um, as a parent, because I know this is you now are a parent of a student in college. Um, yes, soon to be wh- two in college. What kind of what advice would you give to prospective parents as they're as they're beginning this process and they're looking at maybe they're of a rising senior who's just sort of really evaluating their list and they're thinking about adding you know Malloy to the um, to their schools. What advice would you give them through through this process? Hold on to your hats, moms and dads. The the MT audition process is like nothing else. And I have to say with complete honesty, I am so very grateful that neither one of my children wanted to pursue <laughs> this college degree because I do think that it would have killed me to be recruiting for a program while simultaneously trying to get my own children into an MT program. I would have lost my mind. So hats off to you. Um, what I will say is Wait, now that are they holding is, onto their hats yeah. or are we taking hats off? Which one is it? I'm not sure. Okay, there's hats involved no matter what. Do what well, yes, make sure you have a hat. That's all I have to say. It is it is a crazy process. I think the best advice that I can give as a parent is to, if you can consult with a coach, that does not mean you have to buy the gold platinum package and, and, you know, hand your children over to thousands worth, thousands of dollars worth of coaching. Almost every coaching company out there, MTCA included, offers you know, a consultation. Sometimes it can just be helpful to know where to start. Um, And having someone in your corner who does this, you know, whether it is a coach, whether it is someone that you know in a musical theater program, um, someone that you've connected with. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've answered questions for parents just as a parent myself, mm-hmm. you know, I don't care if your kid comes to Malloy Cap 21. Like, I, of course I do. If they want to come here, yes, we'll go through the process together. But like, if our program is not the right fit for you, I am happy to advise as best I can, point you in the right direction. You know, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, have a balanced list but don't overdo it. Don't get caught up in, you're going to see things on social media. My child applied to 757 schools. Like don't do that because here's what I'll, here's what I'll tell you. My daughter who at the time was, was interested in, in, in pre-med. She was not at all interested in musical theater. She applied to 19 schools who advised her to apply to 19 her mother, mm. because I thought 19 was a fair number. I'm like, that's reasonable. Her guidance counselor said, why did you apply to 19 schools? And Riley said, well, my mom said that that was sort of like a low average. And the guidance counselor said, most kids in our school apply to eight, nine at the most. This is like the reverse I, of everyone else's experience where, where the guidance counselor is saying do eight and we're saying, no, you need more than eight for musical theater. No, you what are you talking about? need more than about? eight for musical theater. So <laughs> here I am thinking, well, for every other major, you must at least have to apply to 20. No. Apparently in like the real world, that's not the way it is. <laughs> but unfortunately, musical theater is so it, – it's not just competitive. It's so specific. Mm-hmm. And you never know what each school is looking for. And you don't know what they're looking for from one year to the next. Mm -hmm. That's a problem as well. So, yeah, you do kind of have to cast a wide net. But don't cast it so wide that your poor child, like, wants to off themselves (laughs) because they're auditioning for 4,000 schools. Because God forbid you get 15 acceptances. You're going to go visit every single one of those schools? You certainly can't attend all 15 schools. You can't attend all 15. And even visiting can be a real challenge when you're getting acceptances a week before May 1st. You're Mm. like, so take a deep breath, consult with 
someone, even if it's just what for is a this consultation. Someone? Consult with MPCA. Come, I, mean, well, Rebecca, yes! come on. I mean, come on. <laughs> of course, you're listening to MPCA. Yeah, if you're listening to this podcast, you've already <laughs> discovered them. But I just, I, I just, I, I, I feel for parents who are going into this blind, particularly parents who have no idea what it means to be a musical theater major. And, and Those I don't, poor things. I don't know why, specifically in this business, sometimes people feel a little bit like it's, oh, God, is it okay to get coaching? Is it, Versus like for athletics, no one would be like, I'm going to be a professional volleyball player without a coach, without, without help, a without coach. guidance. Right? You know, right. It's a, doesn't mean that that person's doing all the work for you, but that someone goes, I, I know how this works. I know how to t- talk to these recruiters. I know how to do this thing. Like this is, yes. you know, of course, this is It's an very that, accepted. It's very, very accepted in other industries and in other areas. So why would it not be accepted Right. It's like Some, you're supposed to somehow know how to do it by somehow yourself. Somehow they feel like if you're such a star, if you're really talented, you'll just figure it out. It's like you'll just figure it out. They'll they'll come to you, and it's yeah. like no, no, that it's not like that. It just doesn't work like that. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I one more thing that I would say to parents: try stage mamas, please, mm. please, please try to let your child reach out to the faculty. Let your child talk to the recruiter, the faculty, admissions. It's okay when parents email occasionally, but I will tell you the students whose mothers, particularly mothers, <laughs> I am one, so I can I can say that without you know too much uh, discrimination, who email me these tomes of information mm-hmm. about their child. It's like, you know what? I know you love your kid and I can see that you love your kid, mm-hmm. but let them do it. Mm-hmm. Let I would rather hear, I can't tell you the amount of parents who I know everything about their child, but I have never heard from their child. <laughs> I'm like, does your child want to do this uh-huh. or do you want them to do this? Uh-huh. And that can actually be, I won't say it's a deal breaker because obviously if the kid comes in and they're talented and I get to know them, I'm not holding your parent against you, but I have definitely had students audition for me, they come in like a deer in the headlights and they look so uncomfortable. And I'm Mm -hmm. like, you don't want to do this, honey. Like, Mm -hmm. mommy, don't force your kid to do this. Like, this is not the business that you want to jam your kid into. Mm -hmm. They have to want to do it. And it is, I would much rather have a a, a kid written email Mm -hmm. as opposed to a professionally written email from a parent. Hmm. I want to know the kid. This is going to help to help me to get to know your child. Right. The parent is not going to school with them. Or if they are, no. they, that's a whole extra exactly. expense. You got to do a whole thing if you're, if you're coming along it, to class. My, Henry Fonte used to say, mommy, get in your helicopter and fly away. <laughs> <laughs> and it used to just make me laugh. And I had to like really check myself when I was going through this process with my own children. Mm-hmm. Like, let them do it. Just just know that they can do it. It's the best thing you can do for your kid because they will know that you believe in them. Mm. And that is the best thing that you can do for them. Believe in them and show it. So true. Well, thank you so much for the time today, Rebecca. This has been so fun. Um, if there, if people want to check out more from you, if they want to hear more about you or learn more about Moolah Cap 21, where would we recommend that they check out more information? Well, you can always email me at r. Overton at Malloy.edu. It's pretty easy. And that better um, be students, not parents, emailing. Yeah. Out of our <laughs> no, parents can email me, especially if it's, you know, if you're like rising juniors and you're like, oh gosh, I don't even know where to start. Mm-hmm. Really, it's more like once you're into the audition process, I really do like to at some point hear from your kid. That that would really be that would really be a good thing. Um, we are in the process of a major website rebrand. Mm-hmm. Um, you can go to Malloy.edu. And then you're going to navigate to academics. And then under academics, you're looking for undergraduate programs. Under undergraduate programs, um, you're looking for Malloy Cat 21. And that will bring you to our theater pages. Um, they are very basic. And I've it's very interesting because I've had some people say, your website is great because it's so straightforward. Hmm. But it's not particularly flashy. And some people like, you know, the flash and they want to see more you know, visual stuff. So it really just depends on your, on your, uh, it, um, you know, how you like to view websites, but the information is there. Um, there's a lot of information to read. Our curriculum is right there. Our faculty bios are there. Um, you know, take a look at that. And if you have questions, my contact information is on the bottom of all those pages. Questions, email Rebecca Overton. So, you know, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm and- happy to 
happy to answer. We will put all that in the show notes so people have one click. It sounds like too many clicks to get to that, but we'll have a direct <laughs> click just for you. I'm um, sure. Like, we just like lost everyone. Easy. They're like, and turn it off. They're like, like great. I, we're done I, with I, her. Like, what into what? I know how to Google. <laughs> I have to wait. What? <laughs> um, or Rebecca, thank you so much for the time. It was such a joy. Thank you so much, Charlie. Have a great day. Oh boy, I hope you enjoyed that conversation. Uh, I love how granularly and comfortably she was able to speak about the process um, at small and large. You know, you can really tell she's used to speaking with students early in the process and kind of throughout the process. And she just leads with such warmth and positivity, a really great ambassador for her program. Um, that was a nice long conversation, so I'm going to try to give you a short takeaway. We'll see how I do. Um, Rebecca hit a couple of things. We talked about the pipeline. Yes. Uh, we talked about different de- kinds of degrees, for sure. We talked about that on another episode. We talked about yes and, um, and what it is to have that kind of attitude in the room. Absolutely. I co-sponsor all of those three things. Um, but I thought this might be a nice opportunity to talk a little bit about the interview, uh, since that's something Rebecca brought up being a really big factor for her. Um, we talked about the different constituent parts of an audition in Lara Teeter's episode, uh, and a little bit about adjustments specifically in Tom Miller's. Um, but we haven't really talked much about the interview. At least I don't believe we have uh, from my notes. You can tell me if I'm wrong, tweet at me. You're wrong. You talked about this. It's fine. Um, I think there's, of course, way more to think about than I'm going to be able to hit in just these few minutes. Like my partner, Leo, when we do that mock audition we just did in October, does a whole hour on the interview. Um, But I'm just going to give a little bit of an overview and a couple things to think about um, with the interviews. For me, the biggest goal of an interview is that you want it to feel like a conversation. If it starts feeling like you're giving a speech or you're reading an essay out loud, that's not the goal, right? If you can achieve the kind of back and forth feel of natural speech, that is the win of all wins. That's not to say that it's ever going to feel truly even, right? If they ask you about what your dream roles are, you don't want to say, oh, no, no, you first. What are your dream roles, right? But the biggest factor is being able to listen while you talk, right? Does it seem like the auditor wants to interject and maybe steer the conversation or just has something fun to say so that you might get a little repartee back and forth? If Well, I have an interesting thing about that dream role. If I said I want to play Marius and Les Mis, I'm like, oh, I played Marius in high school. It's like you want to allow for that possible, oh, cool, we have a little back and forth going on, right? See if you can try to engage and communicate with them more than just focus on what are the bunch of words that I'm stringing together. And I really like what Rebecca said about just say something and that they aren't so much judging the content of what you say. I mean, it's just so true. It's not that it's not at all important what you say. Of, Of course, they're listening to your answers and if you say something really interesting, that's great, right? But it is so much more important that what you convey than the words themselves, right? They're trying to get to know you So you don't have to be polished or give some incredibly thought out answer to a question that they're throwing at you for the first time, right? They would so much rather see you genuinely engage with the question thoughtfully, even if that means you have a few likes and ums or you you stumble a little bit with your words, right? If you have to take a second and think about it, right? Or if your answer gets a little bit circuitous because you're, you, I was going this way and then I had to think about that and then I came back. Great. That's all good, right? Polished and professional is not the goal. They want to get to know you and how you think as you are as a teenager. Um, and I think often that like just say something is also where younger students get tripped up. Often in these kind of open-ended questions that you might get, you get stuck with the tyranny of too much choice. And so your mind spins and you kind of grab at nothing, right? Or sometimes you'll kind of grab at something weird and you think, well, I said that, so now I have to follow it down this weird path of, God, I can't believe I'm talking about this now, right? Sometimes I think it's helpful just to relieve yourself of the pressure of a perfect answer. And sometimes if you can get like a pretty good answer, that's great, right? Often when I'm doing interview work with a student, I'll start with those broader questions since I think they're so much harder. And then I'll work toward the more specific before then going back to the broad and seeing how it's a little easier answering the broad once we've done the specific. For instance, just a weird way that our mind works. If I say, tell me about yourself, it's like one of the hardest questions someone can ask. I'm just like, hey, tell me about you. What do I need to know about about you? And you're like, oh God, uh, uh, I'm 17. Um, I'm from Pittsburgh, right? It's like really hard to kind of answer that question well. But if I asked you the question, hey, what would your best friend tell me is their favorite thing about you? That's both a much easier answer, and it also answers the same question. Um, And maybe even easier still for some people would be like, hey, what's the moment you knew you wanted to be an actor? That also answers the same question, right? 
most questions are tell me about yourself when you get down to the root of it. So basically anything that you would answer could be a good answer to tell me about yourself. It's right. It's like your common app essay. Pick something and go with it, right? But but it's just an oddity of the way that we think. When we hear that that big broad question, like, you know, if I asked you, tell me your favorite song, that's just a much harder question than if I said, tell me your favorite song on Abbey Road, right? So for yourself, don't fear the specific. You can always answer a broad question with a specific, and then if it feels too small and granular, broaden it out if that feels right, right? But it's really hard to start with like a large, broad summation of your humanity or of like art itself or what acting is, right? And like If you're trying to sound poetic, it's just, it, you're going to feel stodgy and you're going to feel a little bit stuck. So if someone asks you a question like, hey, what's a weakness you have that you're working on as an actor? You don't have to sum up everything about what you're missing artistically and say exactly the right thing. You could honestly engage with something you're working on. It doesn't have to be the biggest weakness or the right weakness. It's just something that, hey, I've been working on this with my coach. Or I've been working on this with my high school teacher, or whatever it is, right? It, that is much more likely to lead to an interesting conversation and might even lead well into the work itself. They may say, oh, cool, let's work on that, right? I would love to work on whatever the thing that you want to work on is, right? It, it leaves room for there to be a place to go with the back and forth if you give a specific, sometimes smaller answer than feeling like, well, I've answered that question and you'll never need to ask that question again, right? Those kind of vague generalities kind of end the conversation as opposed to leave room for a back and forth where they go, oh, that's interesting. So tell me more, you mean like this? And then you get to go, yeah, this, and go back and forth. And most of all, when we talk about interviews, which I know you're sick of hearing, they want to meet you in the interview. So if you're practicing this stuff and you start to sound a little bit stilted, run in the other direction. I think it can be nice, though. I'm always in a little afraid of having people record themselves. I don't want you to get hyper-conscious of your voice like you're doing a podcast, right? Oh, God, that was so meta because I'm doing a podcast right now, listening to my own voice. Ah! But I do think it can be nice to record yourself. Like have a friend ask you a few of these questions and then listen back and maybe compare that to a recording of just like you guys talking. So if you just like have a meal, just record yourself. Don't think about the fact that the phone's there. You're just talking to them, have a normal conversation and then have them ask you a couple of these questions and just compare those two recordings. Do they sound similar? I mean, they don't have to sound identical, but if you really feel like there's a big difference between those two versions, that's not great, right? Of course, in an audition, we are meeting an idealized version of you. But it should still sound like you and hopefully be pretty close to you, you know, in terms of the voice that's coming out. Well, if you're sick of hearing about being yourself, come yell at me on all platforms at charmur7, that's C-H-A-R-M-U-R-7, where I have recently posted. This is not true. I've not actually posted yet, but I'm saying that because I told myself I was going to post and now I'm going to make an actual post. This is how hard it is for old people to post, kids. I know it's tough. You can also rate and review us um, and maybe review that exact post that I make on all podcast platforms. Check us out at mtca.nyc if you want to work with MTCA for help with your individual college prep, as well as check out MTCA on all the various social mediums. To you, my young artists out there mapping their journeys, get yourself a hat, maybe even a hat on a hat. We'll see you next week. Mapping the